Hey everyone, thank you so much for checking out the WeVA podcast. We have a really special episode today with Arvin Nilakantan, a research scientist at OpenAI. And this is such an interesting timing with this because OpenAI has just launched their Embeddings API, which has been integrated with WeV8 in version 0.10. So you can access the Embeddings API and plug it right into WeV8's vector search database to enable all these cool applications with these deep learning powered representations of unstructured data like text and code with these with the latest models. So first of all, Arvin, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. And I'm so excited to get into all these topics. Uh, I think your career in deep learning science is so exciting. And I loved, uh, you know, reading these publications and kind of seeing your line of thinking with these things. So to kind of kick things off, uh, can you tell me about what's new with the embeddings API? Sure. Um... So uh, we've had the uh, OpenAI API uh, um, to be used uh, for more than a year now. Uh, we started off with uh, generative models for text, uh, moved to code. Um, so the new, uh, so we now have a, a new uh, API endpoint uh, that can convert uh, text and code to 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 a vector, uh, and uh, we we have models that are fairly general purpose. So you can use these vector representations for many downstream tasks uh, like clustering, classification, text search, code search, and so on. So I'm really curious about in your research career, what uh, drew your interest into these contrastive learning methods? Was it these, say, recent computer vision papers like SimClear, MoCo, and say the effectiveness of data augmentation to form these pairings? Mm -hmm. What kind of first grabbed your interest into wanting to really explore contrastive learning? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, those had uh, some impact for sure. Uh, I think uh, uh, the bigger one is uh, when we put out the API, uh, um, people were started to, started to use it for search. Um, so they would use, um, you know, uh, concatenation of the query in the document, get the lock prop from the language model. Uh, and this was like a very high quality relevance score uh, that was very general purpose. Um, but that clearly does not scale uh, to to many documents. Um, so that was like one of the big reasons why I started thinking about this problem. Uh, and also, like if you follow, like if you if you've been following, like kind of the um, uh, research community work on like search, um, kind of like the modern neural network models uh, don't really work that well out of domain for text search. If you have a large label data set, uh, then the embedding methods work quite well. Um, but uh, there were not really good solutions that are that are general purpose and work across a broad set of benchmarks. Uh, and like keyword search uh, with BM twenty five was was like uh, was like a really hard baseline uh, to be um, uh, for like uh, unsupervised search. So what's the say, newest thing in the text embeddings? Is it the contrastive learning loss function compared to maybe in the past where you try to, say, label, uh, mm -hmm. I know in natural language inference, they try to label them as uh, entailment or contradiction yeah. and then core question pairs, you had similarity yeah. labeling. So is that contrastive loss function, is that the big thing that's powering the new advances? Yeah, there are a few things. Um, I think like one thing uh, to start with is uh, like within like text embeddings, um, there was like two uh, research topics, one for learning embeddings for classification tasks and sentence similarity tasks. And then there was a separate research topic hmm. around learning embeddings for search. And uh, it, it felt like a, a little bit like... Uh, not the most optimal route, uh, given that mm -hmm. you know both are uh, going after the goal of getting high quality text embeddings. So, so we kind of like wanted to take the shot of like, can we get like an unsupervised model to produce embeddings that works well across tasks? So, yeah, I would say like the the reason uh, why uh, our models I think are working well is um, you know mix of like large scale unsupervised training. Uh, mm -hmm. initializing initializing with good generative models um, and like uh, and then also uh, contrastive loss with uh, you know sufficiently large batch size yeah those three 
I think things put together are are, are giving us pretty good uh, embeddings. Yeah, it's so interesting that the uh, self-supervised learning from massive internet scale data has enabled this zero shot generalization that maybe supervised learning was never uh -huh. gonna going to achieve. Was that was that always obvious to you from the early beginning of self-supervised learning, or you maybe hesitant on that idea? Uh, no, I mean it was clearly. I mean, uh, the potential was was clear uh, uh, that you know there's just like way more unsupervised data. Uh, and so the, the, the potential is always there. Whether it's going to work out is, you know, it's always a research question that you, you know, gradually build up and uh, see if things are going to work. Um, I, I mean, it, it was also like a problem that had to be solved. Um, if you look at like supervised models, um, they do work on a particular data set, um, but then they're very brittle. Uh, when you test them out of domain, uh, they're not robust. Uh, you know, uh, the adversarial attacks on uh, on supervised models, uh, you know, is, is like super well studied, uh, you know, both in language and other uh, application areas. So, yeah, it, it kind of like uh, felt like, you know, supervised, uh, unsupervised learning uh, is, is really important uh, and had to be studied. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we've been learning about uh, the different use cases people are building with the Weaviate vector search engine. They have such uh, diverse data domains that yeah, yeah, that idea of that zero shot flexibility is such an interesting mm -hmm. part. So, mm -hmm. are you uh, with your latest thinking about the idea that you can have an off the shelf model that covers all data domains? Do you think you still maybe need to uh, mm -hmm. cut it up a little bit? Like, say this is the biomedical BERT, this or like uh, BERT being like the typical acronym when yeah. you're doing this thing where you put data domain and then BERT <laughs> right, like, to yeah, describe yeah. it. <laughs> so, do yeah. you think you still kind of need like computer science paper BERT, news BERT, or are we really about to hit this point where you just have this? one uh thing for general representation that's definitely the goal uh i mean like uh if you look at the paper uh kind of uh um you know we took uh like like the uh, the the central theme in the paper was to take one unsupervised embedding model and evaluate it on like uh i think we evaluate on like some 15 search data sets uh seven classification data sets and then like uh, six or seven more sentence summary data sets. And, you know, we, we use the same embedding model. Uh, I, I think there's something to be said about uh, if a model can work well on, on a large number of tasks, uh, I think it's it's uh, indicating that it is uh, robust, uh, mm -hmm. which I think really, really matters in the real world. Um, um, so, yeah, we, we do hope that... Uh, we can have you know most of the heavy lifting at least most of the heavy lifting done by a single model maybe you need a little bit of uh fine tuning for your domain but not too much so one thing i really want to get into as well is the um the large embedding sizes and kind of mm -hmm. the ideas of how how much embedding sizes you have but quickly before getting into that and and we're going to later on in the podcast talk about this idea of prompting but i mm -hmm. really want to get into this idea of the impact of data pre-processing and i've uh, seen things like, you know, you have to avoid new lines and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. What's yeah. kind of the story behind the data pre-processing for testing this embeddings API out? Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, in the, it's in the documentation. Uh, it's basically, we use slash in as a delimiter uh, for, uh, for like knowing whether something is a query or a document. So it just kind of, uh, it was like, you know, in, in the hindsight, it's like, it was like a bad choice as a delimiter. Uh, but basically, that's the reason why, like, if the text also has slash in, it can kind of mess up the model. Uh, uh, yeah, but that's about it. I don't think there's other pre-processing things you'd have to do. Yeah, it's kind of a tricky step, right, with the um, with the delimiters on the lines and in, uh, internet scale text scrapes. Do you maybe like the idea of using the HTML tags? I've seen that idea coming up and where you maybe use line break or paragraph break and kind of have the structured data in the unstructured data? Yeah, yeah. I mean, our, our hope is we can like get rid of uh, the delimiters uh, altogether in the next run. <laughs> uh, I, I think it, this was like, you know, getting the model to to uh, to initially get good results. We kind of um, 
wanted to try out a lot of things and this was one of the things that that stuck uh but yeah we actually think we can get rid of the delimiters altogether in the next run and you know uh even the slash and pre-processing wouldn't be required so you prefer the idea of having a super long sequence left to right Mm -hmm. yeah that's really interesting and so the structure of the breaking probably not worth the time. <laughs> yeah, cool. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's basically you know the model can handle that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So on the topic of say the um, twelve thousand dimensional vectors, and I think that has such an interesting play in uh, in describing say using PCA to try to take down the, yeah. the size of it, and then things like yeah. say you build up one of these vector indexes, like we like to talk about the HNSW algorithm on Weaviate, and yeah. if you got twelve thousand dimensions in each of the vectors, it makes it a little tougher. Uh, we've also looked into say binary passage retrieval where you can have some kind of optimization where you learn how to have a one zero one zero representation. How important do you think these high dimensional representations are to also achieving this off the shelf, any data domain zero shot flexibility? Yeah, so so if you look at the results in the paper, um, we do uh, report results for like uh, embedding dimensions from thousand to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the largest one, twelve thousand. Uh, you can like cut it by half uh, or more than half. Uh, I think even the four K dimensional vector one, uh, you know, it performs really well. Um, so yeah, if you want the absolute best performance, uh, uh, the twelve thousand one uh, would would uh, would be the one to pick, uh, and it is definitely uh, uh, you know valuable uh, for certain applications that care about the the you know the last uh, few points. For for other ones, you know, uh, even the uh, the four thousand dimensional or the two thousand dimensional one already has pretty good. Uh, Transfer, transfer performance on search and classification. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting part of it is the uh, dimensionality and how much mm-hmm. that kind of makes it cost to run it and things like that. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the evaluation of embeddings and your general thoughts on, say, uh, using the embeddings to retrieve more context for the current input and in that kind of decomposition of retrieve than read for downstream tasks? Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to the second part. Yeah, for the first part, uh, yeah, so we evaluate on, uh, you know, as I mentioned, like classification tasks linear in, the, in a linear probe uh, fashion and uh, text search and code search and also sentence similarity. So, uh, so we evaluate on like four sets of uh, tasks um, and like multiple data sets within each category. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, we decided to give more importance to uh, text search and text classification over text similarity, uh, primarily because the fo- the former ones are more clearly defined and have like a fairly agreed upon uh, definition. Uh, I think sentence similarity as a task uh, is still a little bit vague um, and not clear what the uh, uh, you know the end use cases. Uh, basically, um, you know, if you take two sentences, like we, we talk about this a lot in the paper, if you take like two sentences, like, you know, uh, Jack loves Jill, uh, Mary loves chocolate. Uh, are these two sentences similar? I mean, uh, yeah, kind of, uh, but are they really, uh, maybe not. I mean, it's, it's, so it's like, it's, uh, it's quite vague. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, we, we like the classification and text search benchmarks. I think they are more uh, clearly defined. Yeah, and I, I know our WeVA users agree that this. Uh, we like the text search and think of that. And I don't know if too many WeVA users are fitting linear probes on the embeddings and using that for their downstream supervised learning tasks. Mm-hmm. So I do want to get more into this um, retrieve then read decomposition yeah. where. Uh, where the idea of you retrieve some context to say Mm -hmm. uses data augmentation for your input. And we love this idea. We love say this particular thing of solving this problem of hallucination where these generation models generate like URL links that don't go anywhere and all sorts of (laughs) things like that. So we love the idea that you can retrieve factually correct information. You have the interpretability where you can see what it's retrieved. You can update what it's retrieved. And then we like the idea that you don't have to store the 
end to end the data in the model that also does the downstream tasks. So can you tell me more about your thinking about uh, the retrieve and re kind of decomposition of tasks? Yeah, I think it's definitely an exciting direction. Um, yeah, it, 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 to me, it does make sense that uh, you don't want to store uh, all the knowledge in the weights of the neural net. Um, and um, uh, so, so, so it, it's like we as humans also don't do that. Uh, we look up information all the time uh, to uh, that can help us guide to do uh, what we want to do. Uh, so, yeah, I think like factual generation uh, and things like that, um, I feel like the idea of like having some way to retrieve relevant information. Uh, and then like our general models are, you know, starting to get fairly robust in the sense that they can start using information in the context uh, and leveraging it while while uh, solving a task. So. It, it feels like uh, this is starting to get to work. So I want to talk a little more about how that kind of changes the problem into the K nearest neighbor regression and, and some of the evaluations in the paper about uh, not just zero shot, but that K nearest neighbor where you go to your training set, you find the nearest neighbors and you use that to inform the current prediction. Yeah. Yeah. Glad you asked that question. It's like uh, one of my favorite uh, experiments uh, in the paper. Uh, so we take this, uh, to give more context, we give, take this uh, sentiment classification data set uh, from Stanford. Um, so the task is given, given an input text. Uh, you want to say whether uh, the sentiment is positive or negative. Mm -hmm. uh, so we evaluate on uh, four different settings. Uh, one is zero shot. Uh, so here we basically embed the text uh, get a vector, and then embed the labels, positive and negative. And then zero shot is just uh, whichever labels embedding is closest to the input text is uh, embedding. This works actually fairly well. Uh, it kind of like works better than like the supervised uh, neural nets that were introduced along with the original paper. Uh, uh, and then we also try out uh, zero shot with prompting. Uh, so instead of just positive or negative, we just make a simple prompt saying, this is a positive piece of text, this is a negative piece of text, and then use that embedding. Uh, mm -hmm. We get a tiny boost in performance by doing that. Um, and then uh, the third one, uh, which is something you talked about, is k-nearest neighbors. Uh, so we take uh, the embedding of the uh, input text and then look up k nearest examples in the training set. And then the label is just basically the majority one. Uh, this actually works quite well. Uh, it's very close to linear classification, uh, which I think is super interesting. Uh, basically, it means you don't need any task uh, specific tuning of parameters to get uh, at least a decent performance. Uh, and yeah, I think this is like one of the uh, one of the surprising findings, at least for me, from the paper. Yeah, I think that's an extremely interesting testimony to the potential of that retrieved and read decomposition that you can get the K nearest neighbor, I guess just parsing it again, because I think that's amazing that the linear probe fine tuning for the task is outperformed by the K nearest neighbor or on, on par, similar. It's like comparative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like comparative. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. With, with just uh, K nearest neighbor. I think that's so interesting. And, uh, as you're talking, it kind of reminded me of, say, with Clip, the way that you have a label representation by the text sequence of this is an image of a cat, this is an image of a dog. Yeah, that's true. It's, 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 uh, it's exactly the same. Yeah. I think in uh, like meta learning papers, too, they have like prototypical networks where they also learn like an embedding of a. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's such an interesting way to think about that problem to have embeddings for labels. I, I was yeah, thinking about yeah. those one hot vectors kind of yeah. and that kind of way of thinking about it. So I, I really want to talk more about prompting. I think that's such uh -huh. an interesting kind of thing with uh with the open AI papers. And so firstly yeah. I wanted to talk about uh there's a recent paper uh titled Prompt Bert, where they're uh mm -hmm. saying that basically if instead of doing uh, X where you have your sequence and then mask and then you say index a CLS token to get the embedding. If you add the template, the sentence X means mask these like templates is the idea of prompting. 
this kind of thing like helps the representation in a in that paper in a massive way. So I'm really curious if uh, if you've explored prompting for not just the downstream tasks in the sense of say the few shot GPT three idea, but uh -huh. in the sense of producing embeddings through the API. Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, we've not really studied uh, prompting uh, at train time. Uh, uh, we explored prompting at test time. Uh, so yeah, I discussed those results with uh, um, sentiment classification where uh, it did seem to help. Uh, I also tried this for search. Um, so uh, the beer benchmark has data sets you know, across uh, domains, you know, as a data set about COVID, it has a data set about, you know, financial stuff and things like that. So I tried to do a prompt, uh, prom I tried to do, do a prompt experiment where I add something like, uh, you know, apart from the query itself, uh, I uh, kind of have a prefix that says, uh, this is a query uh, about uh, asking for information about COVID. This is a query asking information about finance stuff. Uh, it didn't seem to help that much uh, in my initial experiments. Uh, I mean, but it was like definitely not something that uh, uh, we studied very rigorously. And I think uh, there's something, I think there's something there in that area, yeah. So are you interested in uh, in this idea of prompt search where you're searching for the optimal prompt? Again, the idea of uh, this is a query about code would be one example of doing it or say, hey, I have a question about code would be like another discrete way of representing your prompt. And then uh, another idea maybe is continuous prompt tuning where they put mm -hmm. the prompt into the embedding space, optimize it with gradients. Mm -hmm. How do you think maybe the search for prompts differs from the search for factual information, which were most commonly kind of studying when we're talking about most of the search? Yeah, I think this is one of the cool uh, research directions uh, that's coming out. Uh, yeah, I, I want to answer it with like, uh, you know, with few different things. Uh, uh, first thing, yeah, as I mentioned, like I think the factual generation stuff uh, is really interesting to get additional information in the prompt. Uh, uh, the generator models are, you know, robust and sensitive to context that it can leverage that. Mm -hmm. The second one about retrieving things from the training set, uh, it's uh, it's actually one of the endpoints in OpenAI. It's called classification uh, that uh, takes like the nearest neighbors from your training set and puts it in the prompt. Uh, that does seem to work better uh, than like, you know, randomly putting in some examples. Uh, so yeah, again, uh, yeah, the whole idea of like constructing these prompts on the fly at test time are super important. And I think uh, they're starting to work quite well. Um, yeah, f finally, uh, kind of like, you know, doing some kind of like more expensive search um, for prompts, uh, either at train or test time. Um, you know, I think that again, uh, I feel like has a lot of potential uh, in the sense that the unsupervised models are fairly general uh, and have a lot of information. Uh, and the, in some sense, the current kind of context you provide to them steers the model only to a certain extent to the task or the input you care about. And I don't think it like actually kind of extracts all the juice out of the model. And I think these methods of for like searching uh, for prompt, I think are super promising to kind of, you know, get the model to focus more on exactly the thing you care about. Yeah, and I've always loved the idea of like ensemble techniques. And I think maybe having a bunch of different outputs that come from a few different prompt sources could also be another way of having like an ensemble at test timing. And we love thinking about, say, connecting several different retrievals together. Like as we build these end-to-end -end search yeah. pipelines, we like to have, say, BM25, TFIDF, a couple yeah. different experts, depending on how you train them and yeah. have all these different things. And so, yeah, I think like having a few different uh, prompts could be mm -hmm. a, a really interesting way to have like an ensemble. Do, is there like, uh, generally I'm thinking of, say, you have a separate kind of embedding for query and document in that kind of line of thinking, do you think you should have a separate kind of embedding for input output kind of examples compared to documents of like 
information compared to like task informations. Do you like that kind of idea of separating or just one embedding for every kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely more convenient if you can have one embedding for everything. Uh, mm -hmm. It's hard to argue against that. Uh, um, uh, yeah, our, our hope uh, and I think our kind of like first crack uh, at embeddings is that we can probably get like one embedding that seems to work well across tasks and across like use cases. Um, yeah, so yeah, otherwise I feel like, you know, uh, the, 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 the system you're ultimately building has too many moving parts, you know, errors propagate, <laughs> things like that. Uh, and whereas now I think having like a single model uh, that can do all these things uh, feels like the right way to do it. Yeah, and so transitioning a bit, I I love how kind of like uh, the clip model, this is like multimodal with text and code. And I can't wait to talk more about uh, deep learning for code and that particular application of just generating code such as codex and that kind of thing. But first, kind of back to the text embedding side, do you think it gets say uh, like that kind of reasoning information, that program execution from the code data that transfers into the text domains. Yeah, like maybe we have this decomposition of say factual retention and then like reasoning and reasoning is kind of a pretty abstract thing, but it seems like one idea for that would be to look at say mathematical expressions and their evaluations and then just language model that or logic expressions, language model that. And similarly with like the code outputs, just language model that. Do you think that kind of property of the reasoning of that kind of symbolic execution translates into the text applications? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether it has to be through like, uh, you know, output of executing uh, something. Uh, I feel like this, the signal there is quite sparse. Uh, you know, you get very few bits of information. Uh, from like, you know, like if you execute a program and give like, you know, I don't know, one number back. And if the model is learning from that, I think it's like, uh, the I think models might overfit. Um, but yeah, I think if you can instead like actually uh, have some like re reasoning logic or code that you're like, can additionally, you know, guide the model towards reasoning. I think that, that is definitely super promising. Awesome. So coming into Codex and how I think these CPC embeddings, and we talked about the retrieve and read decomposition, how these could probably take Codex yeah. to the next level with our search powering. Uh, so before that, uh, generally, what are your thoughts on deep learning for code? Is it like, because uh -huh. to me, it seems super exciting. I love yeah. this topic of deep learning for code. Yeah, I, I think it's super uh, exciting. And it's like, uh, you know, it's amazing that it's like starting to work uh, really well. Like, uh, you know, I, I use uh, Copilot, uh, uh, you know, uh, every day for programming. And it's like, uh, you know, it's like super useful. Uh, you know, if uh, I, I notice a huge difference when it's when I have it and when I don't. It's just like uh, very, very useful as in very, very useful as autocomplete. I uh, don't have to look up in other places that much. Uh, so, and like, you know, just the whole kind of like, just, just from a u user perspective of like, you know, I can, if I write the comments well, uh, I can usually get a good first draft, uh, which I think is like, you know, uh, takes a lot of, uh, uh, frees up a lot of uh, mental space for me to like think about other stuff. So I think it's just like amazing that it started to work and, yeah, I think it's, uh, um, you know, it's one of the, it's prob probably the best application of uh, deep learning models. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I personally agree with that. I think some people might want to get AlphaFold 2 in there and yeah. <laughs> have that one also yeah, yeah. In, the, sure. in the book. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, I've seen so many amazing testimonials of Copilot and it's so incredible. And but I mean, coming from Copilot, which is something that already works and we're not even in the clouds, but to go into the clouds, do you think this idea that you could just kind of loosely sketch like an idea for a deep learning paper and then it could <laughs> write you PyTorch code that would create the paper, maybe even set up like a weights and biases callback, like all the yeah. kind of things that you would need? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the current ones, uh, uh, not sure how you can do that. <laughs> I think it is like, 
fairly uh, uh, more like uh, specific. Uh, you know, you know, you can definitely do things like you know set up uh, weight and biases and it'll do the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I I don't know whether you can do something like you know make the transformer. Uh, attend to uh, a <laughs> million tokens in a rough thousand. <laughs> I, I need some more work. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that kind of high level. Make this attend over in yeah. qu in quadratic, like linear complexity to in the just a natural language description. But yeah. so, so coming down from kind of that big vision of it that I think is so captivating, one of the most interesting technical details of, of Codex to me is the repeated sampling and how you say mm -hmm. have the tree structured decoding, things like top K beam search where you go through yeah. the tree several times and you got that trade-off between diversity, quality, kind of similar to sampling from any generative model, like an image model or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then you have this kind of maybe a deduplication step, which is maybe something that I want to bring Weaviate back into, which I think, and coming back to this search thing, because having these search embeddings let you also embed the tree traversals to mm -hmm make sure you pass less noise and overall make codex more yeah. efficient. Have you thought about that kind of putting CPC in the uh, filtering of the repeated sampling for say codex? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I, I, I saw that the, for example, um, uh, the alpha code work, um, mm. you know, they sample a lot, a lot of candidates and then they do some kind of clustering, uh, mm -hmm. but their clustering is based on, uh, input output behavior uh, okay. rather than embeddings uh, so that's like feels like one you know place where it can you can easily apply something like uh, embeddings there uh, code embeddings there uh, but yeah in general uh, I do think that um, you know uh, using these embeddings to guide the search process it feels very natural, yeah. Yeah, just the general idea of uh, the embeddings for traversing the trees, I think, is general applicability. And kind of coming back to the <laughs> the cloud idea, as I said, this idea that if you're gonna if you're gonna write code that generates a deep learning experiment, it takes so much time to run it. It's not like code forces where you can where you can filter by input output behavior because you can just run it, mm -hmm. right? So you would need kind of that yeah. search layer to. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, and I also really like the idea of, say, how this could help people with like their specific Python libraries that they're building up and yeah. help people get kind of the adoption, the question answering and that kind of uh, support. So I'm curious what you think about, say, the role of code language models, code search tools, generation for, say, facilitating open source projects. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... Uh so I, I think like uh, the the best results we get in the paper are on like uh, code search very clearly. Uh, you know our model seems to be uh, re really really good at code search uh, across multiple languages, uh, and in some sense I feel like text search is you know is a, is a super well studied problem. Uh, we have really good benchmarks. Um, we have lots and lots of methods and papers and, you know, software libraries uh, for, for tech search. Um, and, you know, th there are places where uh, you feel like, oh my God, tech search sucks. Uh, but in many places, I think it does, it does a decent job. Uh, whereas I feel like code search, I think has a much farther way to go. Uh, and it's, uh, and like, I, I almost feel like it's probably the case that code search is like lags a lot behind text search in, in applications it is because keyword search works really well for text and you can like kind of build your first application based on that, uh, where it's not that easy to do that for code search and you really need some way to uh, capture the semantics of text and code so that you can do search. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I really think uh, our models can like start uh, powering uh, the next generation of code search tools. Yeah, I definitely think so as well. And um, just a quick question, how big is the impact of like the compiler and input output to it? Like, because the, the text search and the thing and the problem with it is it's so hard to evaluate it, right? Like, because mm -hmm. we, we say things like uh, when we were interviewing Charles Pierce at Kenius and they're building a scientific paper recommendation system and that idea of serendipitous discovery and fuzzy yeah. search where 
it's like, here's a similar paper. Did it help you? Like, it's, it's harder to evaluate really compared with yeah. the code where it's like, it's correct. Like, yeah, it's not, yeah. So. yeah exactly. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think code search is like super uh, well-defined task. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I think um, the, the data set that's commonly used, uh, code search net, uh, is, is quite, uh, I think it's like uh, the the training set is is noisy. Uh, it's a script from uh, just like open source code, but I think they have like a um, at least a subset of test set that's like more clearly uh, marked with like whether this is the correct code for the mm -hmm. uh, for the query. And I think uh, it's it's a it's a nice way to test these models. Yeah, and I think like how we say with um, unsupervised text learning, we can use back translation from English to French back to English. And I yeah. think one, one heuristic we've seen with code is, uh, I think this paper is titled Break It, Fix It, where they uh, mm -hmm. corrupt the code so it doesn't compile and they use that to kind of get the data and it's a similar kind of back translation mm -hmm. way of generative models that generate their own data and that kind of like huh. data augmentation Interesting. scheme. Interesting. I see. So, so you would like train training a model to go from like a thing that like doesn't work to thing that works, and like using the compiler as a way to get the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Because I think debugging is is a huge application of this. <laughs> I know from like learning how to code that kind of you know hair pull your hair out thing where you can't figure out how to get past the error yeah. or whatever it might be. Yeah. Yeah. So does that kind of use of the ground, the reward signal from the compiler, the input output pairs, does that inspire your interest in reinforcement learning? And I, I know we haven't brought this up at all yet, but generally, mm -hmm. what are you, what's your thought on reinforcement learning for these applications? I mean, like, you know, like if you step back, I feel like search is probably an application that has benefited the most from uh, human feedback, uh, starting from click data. Uh, I, I think like uh, the, uh, like the, the the like all search engines uh, benefit from that click data, and yeah, and I think with code there's this uh, way of like verifying uh, verifying your code through input output tests. Yeah, I think it, I think all that is like definitely super helpful. So we've talked about quite a few topics, and um, so one thing is we we mentioned say I think the best transition for this would be to bring back up that idea of reasoning. And as we have these deep sequential neural networks, they have several layers, and they maybe reason through their representations. That idea of like parsing and selecting the information. So I'm trying to transition into this idea of latent knowledge representations, and mm -hmm. say exploring that in these models and say uh, vector quantization is another really exciting topic so i'm curious what are your what's your thinking around uh just latent space exploration whether it's like a generative image model or one of these chatbot kind of neural assistant things huh like uh do, do you mean is it like specifically like looking uh looking up a knowledge source or is it more like you're uh spending some search compute to infer like activations or yeah, the, the the latter one, where you're trying to search to find what's going on at this network. What's it thinking? If, uh, if you want to use that kind of anthropomorphization of it and say it's thinking, but <laughs> yeah, 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 I, I get it. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, th th this is kind of like related to like uh, the idea that like you know, especially once you have these unsupervised models that are very broad. Um, they they don't get like uh it's like at, at test time uh usually i think they they don't they're not given like enough context to focus on the task on on that particular input uh and yeah i think methods that can like uh you know let the model uh um you know uh do a lot more uh you know, do do a lot more uh, thinking, as you say. Uh, mm -hmm. at, at this time, it's, it's definitely a promising idea. Um, yeah. yeah, like maybe things like say like uh, PonderNet or like early exiting networks where you scale up the capacity to kind of simulate it. Yeah, and also I would say like you know uh, we touched on this before the idea of like sampling a lot of things and then mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, finally deciding which one to use. 
uh, I think all, all of this kind of falls under this bucket of like, you know, uh, let's have the model uh, do a lot more things at test time and see uh, if we can figure out uh, a way to like get uh, these models to perform even better. Yeah, so transitioning like a bit into say how we can kind of understand it, do you see discrete bottlenecks in the intermediate representations of the network as being a way that we can understand what, how it might be reasoning? Ah, uh, yeah. So I, I feel like interpret, interpretability with neural nets has always been uh, challenging. Uh, in, in And I, I think, tr- I, I don't know whether having discrete activations would help with interpretability or not. Uh, And yeah, you know, if it's like going to be like, you know, VQBA codes and like that are like also very high dimensional, uh, they're discrete, but still high dimensional. I don't think you gain a lot of interpretability. Uh, um, So, yeah. So generally that kind of, is it maybe just more so it's like a compression thing than it is that idea? I, I think so. I, I, I think uh, I, I think those techniques are useful because they help us uh, compress, you know, very long inputs, especially in the perception domain to, to like, a, you know, you create a bottleneck. Mm-hmm. So also on this topic of bottlenecks with say like architecture bottlenecks, do you, I think I know the common practice generally is to say apply them to have the transformer be isomorphic. It has the original input sequence length by say the embedding dimension and then the the tension layers. They never compress that into say like in computer vision architectures, how say like UNet we would mm-hmm. turn it into a vector, skip connection, up sampling, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the funnel transformer has applied a similar kind of idea. And then another one of the most popular embedding a, embedding models out there, uh, Siamese Burr sentence Burr. They also have yeah. that um, compression. So what do you think about that kind of style of compression? Yeah, I mean, in, in general, I feel like for text, for, you know, context lens, we usually have, uh, uh, I, I think like, uh, you know, the OpenAI API, some of the longer models, and even that I think is like 2000 tokens. Uh, and like a lot of the open source ones, are like 500 tokens or even smaller. At that stage, when you're dealing with text, uh, I don't think you buy a lot by compressing uh, hmm. because like like parallel att- attention uh, for that context line seems to be fine. Uh, but I mean, the moment you move to another modality um, that has, you know, higher kind of... Uh, or like lower signal to noise ratio, uh, um, like perception tasks, or if you want to do like text models that are just like way way longer context, uh, I think that's when again like this kind of uh, bottlenecks in the architecture starts start uh, helping you out. Um, you know, like vision transformer, kind of the first step is to uh, you know do like a very rough. Um, encoding of the image in 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 a in a low dimensional space and then you run the transformer on top of that and that seems to be working quite well so mm-hmm. kind of wrapping up i know we talked about so many things from the yeah. embeddings api retrieve then read decomposition contrastive losses and the search for yeah. negatives and i mean all sorts of things from prompting etc with the as there'll be the show notes for people watching the podcast but so okay. kind of um to wrap it up and a question that i'm curious about is um what is kind of like what motivates you? Like, is it a is it your curiosity of the algorithms? Do you have a particular application in mind that drives you? Yeah, I think a bit of both. Uh, I definitely, uh, you know, kind of look at um, you know what are things that we can currently solve uh, with the techniques we know. You know, what are things uh, we know work well? Know that things that don't work well. So try to uh, you know understand. Uh, the current, uh, you know, cu- current capabilities of our models and trying to push that. Uh, and also definitely seeing the other side too of like, you know, w- what, are, what are things that can have uh, good real world uh, impact? So yeah, I would say a bit of both. And so one more question like that. Uh, so mm-hmm. what is kind of your information diet? How do you handle this like massive velocity of new information in deep learning? 
Oh yeah, that's really hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think there's like so much, so many papers coming out. Um, I don't know. In in some sense, it's like uh, you know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel like uh, I, I think Jeff Hinton has this like uh, <laughs> advice on like uh, you know don't read too many papers. Uh, uh, it will stop you from being creative. Uh, I, 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 I can see where he's coming from. Uh, I feel like um, I, I try to, you know, try to basically bucket things into some kind of high level categories and saying, okay, mm-hmm. you know, these are, you know, these are the sets of ideas we have. These are the sets of problems we have, you know, and, and like th- these are the capabilities that our current models have and here's where we lack and kind of try to think from there and kind of not think too hard from a specific paper's point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I mean, of course, then once you decide to work on something and you're trying to improve something, then you start diving deeper into that area, trying to understand a specific paper or a specific set of papers in a lot more detail. Uh, but yeah, uh, for for like high level kind of thinking about what to work on next, it's a lot more ab- abstract than a single paper. Yeah, that's something I've noticed, and I, I imagine like once you get to your level, you have such an abstraction over the categories that it really helps uh, do that filtering. Whereas, like I think when you're starting out, you see like neural mm-hmm. neural radiance fields, and you, yeah. you're like all over the place with these different things and. I think the better you get, the better those high level categories guide your the buckets as you yeah, I think that's such a well described way of handling that. Yeah, I think you also get better at uh reading papers over time. Like, you know, papers yeah. where you know, you're like, okay, I get the high level idea from the abstract. You know, sometimes you go into the results and then, you know, when to actually go deeper. Uh I think you kind of like get better at that over time. Awesome. So Arvin, thank you so much for doing the WeVA podcast. I hope our listeners, uh, you know, excited about the open AI embeddings API and using it in, in the WeVA search and powering all sorts of search applications. So many interesting details to explore with, with these algorithms and, and what they can do. So thanks again so much for coming on the podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It was uh, fun chatting with you. <laughs>